um, that will take us quite smoothly over um, to our final uh, participant for today, Professor Namana Puja. Hi. Um, Naman is a curator of Indian art and professor at Jawaharlal University. I have been among many uh, lucky students of Naman, um, and to hear him again is, is a privilege. He is most noted for his critically acclaimed exhibition, The Body in Indian Art and Thought, and that's an exhibition which we have uh, also listened to Naman speak in depth. Um, his curatorial work started at the British Museum in 2001, followed by exhibitions at Casa Asia in Barcelona, the Ashmolean in Oxford, but he's also done extensive cataloging of the collection. Um, his studies in terracottas and also his own practice in terracotta as an artist, one should say, is most interesting in the way that he crosses over into so many different material histories. And this kind of obsession really to think deeply and critically about Indian iconography and transcultural exchanges at an everyday quotidian level. He has authored various books such as Divine Presence, The Art of India in the Himalayas in 2003, The Making of Modern Indian Artist Craftsman, Devi Prasad, again an exhibition also was included, um, which we all learned a lot from in terms again of what these hierarchies between high and low art are, what it means for an artist pedagogue to influence a huge range of practitioners. The body in Indian art and thought is also available as in book form. His research also includes the art and interiors of Rashtrapati Bhavan. We're going to talk today about India and the world, a history in nine stories, for the C an exhibition for the CSMBS Mumbai, and also at the National Museum in Delhi which explored the terms and narratives through which Indian art can enter a discourse of globalization to which I would add narrations based on shared human responses, not relying on well-worn history telling, but instead publishing and displaying what is outside of the canon of Indian art history, in being inclusive of folk artisanal and tribal traditions beyond the classical norm and through it also engaging with debates around gender, race, class, and caste. Welcome, Naman. We look forward to listening. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Am I um, audible and is it all all right? Can you? Um, yes. 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 All right. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to just, I'm just going to dive right in to the conversation that we've been having. and the way it's been progressing since yesterday. And I wanted to make a, an opening remark, um, not as a kind of a caveat, but more as a kind of a statement of fact about that something that we really need to think about. When we're dealing with temporary exhibitions and dealing with the kind of curatorial narratives that we find imperative, the kind of um, ethical, moral, social compulsions that guide us as curators, become a very different thing when you have to work with big institutions that tell uh, civilizational histories. When you're dealing with government funded major institutions like the British Museum, like the national museums of different countries, they come with their own, uh, um, I won't say baggage, but they come with their own institutional imperatives and their own pedagogy way in which art history has been constructed in those nation states, the way in which those textbooks are written, what the qualifying exams for the curators who work in those institutions are. And that takes us to a very different kind of curator that one has to deal with, not the curators who are as a member of this hub talking about curatorial imperatives, but a very different kind of um, civilizational history and art history that has to be communicated by them. And all too often, um, the public that consumes contemporary art and narratives expects a very different kind of socio-political relevance compared to those who go into national museums to see civilizational histories, which are told to them in a very didactic manner without the complexities of the narratives as we were hearing becoming participatory and 
as a result, taking that leap to open that institution up to having a dialogue with the public about the very idea of history or what that civilizational history means can take a lot of negotiation. And institutions and governments therefore come to create exhibitions and to create their national museums with their own agendas. And sometimes we in the contemporary art world and at this hub may think of that as being completely atavistic, yet that is catering to a very substantial visitor number. And we need to consider that visitor number as well in our conversations. So visitors, audiences, and curators each come up with diverse narratives as we've been hearing. And one of those today is a requirement to respond to the requirement to, uh, to respond to the question of decolonization. Now, decolonization may be more relevant in some countries, I think, especially colonial countries, but there are many other issues today that are more important in the formerly colonized countries. Post-colonial Indian concerns, such as the erosion of vast habitats of forests, animals, and people, atrocities of gender, communalism, casteism, the disregard for labor, the marginalization of various kinds that we see around us are perhaps more pressing narratives than can be addressed by the single narrative of decolonization. So how much emphasis are we going to lay from an Indian position on this requirement? Is, is it as important for us here as it is for the British Museum to be participating in the narrative of decolonization. It's a more important narrative somewhere else. Now that brings us to another complexity. Is it more important for the diasporic Indian then than it is for the Indian Indian? And this makes it an unequal playing field in a global network. That are we going to serve the moral ethical interests for Britain through exhibitions in India? Or are we going to use the opportunity for collaborative exhibitions to be able to showcase the, those imperatives which are essential for an Indian audience? The question becomes complicated because without addressing decolonization in Western education and museums, a wound is left open and a ground for the equitable sharing of artifacts and knowledge as we were just hearing cannot be achieved. So the backlash that Western museums face periodically brings them infamy on account of changing social perception. The courage to bring these narratives forward will keep the museum at the vanguard of knowledge. So they will admit to the decolonizing narrative. So the starting point for my talk today is the double bind that museums find themselves in. How will they protect the voices that bring them infamy? Because even infamy is more acceptable than irrelevance. Big universal museums have to cater to many different constituencies of interest groups, as I was saying. Telling stories is reliant on communication skill knowing what narratives audiences require, yet it is reliant above all on research of the collections housed in that museum. So the stories about or around objects are what can make them relevant. Many discourses that have been uncomfortable for the establishment have gained ground for them to no longer be ignored by the museum. And as I was saying, maintaining relevance for the objects housed in the institution is as important as maintaining the collection itself. So custodianship and the narrative are the two concerns, both the curare aspect of the word curator, as well as the idea of the Ajayib Ghar, the house of wonder and curiosity that the narrative is going to bring are both 
relevant uh, uh, job profiles for the curator. Okay, so with that as a preamble, how did we negotiate what was going to happen in an exhibition called India in the World? Um, Joshua, could you turn my presentation on, please? And can we see the first slide, just so that people get an idea about what it is that I'm talking about? Um, India and the World was an exhibition that was held a couple of, oh, three years ago at the CSMVS Museum in Mumbai. And it was a collaboration with the British Museum. An equal number of objects were loaned by Indian institutions, and it wasn't just the CSMVS that was loaning objects, it was 23 museums all over India that lent objects for this show. And about 100 plus objects, 125 odd objects came from the British Museum, which were matched, as I said, with an equal number in India. And the objects were staged in strategic conversations or dialogues. Now, the main concern, the way in which the exhibition was curated was to try and follow a chronological timeline and take people through the main didactic purpose of what a universal museum does. Now, modeled as it was, or inspired as it was by the history of the world in a hundred objects, it tried to follow the same narrative thread by selecting certain key moments in world history. Now, quite the, the, the opening premise of the exhibition, I should make clear, was that the British Museum was not going to lend Indian objects from its collections to India on the premise that India already had all of those kinds of objects in, in their collections. And it was more relevant for them as a big universal museum to be lending those kinds of objects that India did not have. So things that Indian audiences would not have got to see had they, if they didn't have the opportunity to travel to Western Museum. This made the exhibition manageable financially as well as administratively as well, reducing the, the burden of loans that had to come from London. Um, so what happens then is that we, we do create these dialogues, but there are problems because if you take an anodyne view towards just telling a chronological view of history, there are no narratives for the people to hold on to. To be able to create those narratives, we ran into problems while creating those narratives because we found that what was of civilizational importance at one moment in history in one culture was not echoed or was not exactly similar to what was happening in another part of the world at the same time. And so you could have two 16th century objects right next to each other, but you were comparing apples and oranges and you didn't have the narrative arc that you necessarily wanted. So this is just a, I mean, I'm just making it simple, but telling history, as we all know as curators, ultimately is always done from someone's perspective of the evidence. Now, once upon a time when audiences perhaps were more homogenous or bourgeois and mostly of one ethnicity, this requirement was fulfilled more easily. These narratives, today as we inherit them are heavily critiqued in a post-colonial feminist globalized world. And yet the museum of history and especially those museums that house antiquities find themselves in a difficult position to alter their narratives and maintain relevance. The challenge global audience participation poses to museum is about who owns history? Is it the victor or powerful as used to be the case? Or will narratives shift focus to the stories of those who wish to visit the museum, those who may once have been vanquished in order that their objects be used to be able to fill that very institution called the museum. In such a case, which is becoming evident all around us already, museums also have to hire personnel of diverse ethnicities to speak for the many histories they comprise. And so all of us get jobs. Yet the museum's goal of bringing discursive equality to the collections that share the same space is still not being achieved. The depth of available research on their collections is overwhelming for Western publics. 
and the level of the official storyline then falls back to old cliches of representing India or any other country as something exotic, something marvelous or dexterous, something that is steeped in religion. And all too often, these many others find themselves stereotyped, forced to play a role circumscribed by the present agendas of history that are set by the establishment or fulfilling a curatorial role that is merely tokenistic. Can we move to the next slide? So for the entrance to the CSMBS, we had the good fortune of the British Museum lending to India the famous Townley Discobulus statue. And we decided in the entrance rotunda to surround it by uh, echoing the movement of the Discobulus with a counterclockwise movement of objects from Indian history. Not gods, but semi-divine beings that also epitomize strength. And not all of them were historical objects. Can we move to the next slide? We included this fantastic statue of a bronze Hanuman made only in the 1970s, but in the collection of the Crafts Museum of India. Welcoming the public then, bookending the show right at the beginning was something that came from the so-called tribal or indigenous cultures of living India, as well as at the end of the very show when there was this Vadli painting by Divya Soma Mahashe, also from the collection of the Crafts Museum. It was imperative to be able to, for me as a curator, to try and take that epitome of Western civilization and art historical discourse, the town late discobulus, and stage it in a strategic conversation with the, the culture that it was now within in the institution where it was now going to be exhibited. Of course, there are all these narratives about, are we going to disturb the canon adequately? How are we going to be able to display a narrative like for like, even though things might be temporarily apart? Um, are we going to give them the same status? And I think it was a very brave move and I'm very grateful to the CSMBS Museum for giving me the opportunity to be able to express that and bring that creativity into the very entrance of the show and then carry on with these themes right the way through. It, it required tremendous support on the part of the CSMVS to allow that curatorial imagination to uh, express itself. Can we see the next slide, please? Um, now, when we talk about using big opportunity sh shows like this for the opportunities that they present us, this was also a chance to dive into forgotten museums and collections of India. It wasn't just about adding to the canon of Indian art history on a global scale or in a world uh, discourse by looking at indigenous or contemporary India in relation to historical artifacts, but also to be able to look into the history of India that has not been adequately explored. There are many small museums all over India that have objects that actually shake up what we know of Indian history. There are states in India that don't even have museums yet. There are sites where, which desperately are crying out for new museums to be built. And the opportunity had to be used to be able to bring attention to those, to those places. So this Bronze Age bull, um, two bulls from the Bronze Age, um, um, one a copper hoard object from Bengal, from the collection of the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, the other, a small agate bull with gold horns that comes out of Haryana. Yeah. Now, Bengal is not normally considered, we always talk about the Indus Valley and we don't talk about what might be happening in Bengal at the same time. And so this was an opportunity to be able to um, slightly try and tip the balance and um, use other objects in the, in the narrative. Um, I think the third issue that has been talked about a lot, and I'm gonna give you a, just a small slide that I've prepared that I hope will uh, you'll see and try and understand my difficulties as a curator. Can we see the next slide? 
if we are talking about a curatorial requirement to serve diverse audiences and to bring these narratives to bear, then we also have to think in terms of the language of that visitor. We can't be as curators thinking in, in, in um, our bourgeois Western educated uh, method and expect our audiences to catch up with what are our imperatives, however ethical and morally sound they may be. So for instance, there was a big hullabaloo that uh, the British Museum must lend great works of art and we must get um, the choicest pieces from Britain to come to India. And they said, well, we can't have an exhibition on world art without Rembrandt. And of course, everyone in the English speaking world was perfectly comfortable with the idea that we must have a Rembrandt. But um, the question had to be asked by other people that, okay, now, now try and tell this in Marathi or try and tell this story in, uh, which is uh, the language around uh, Mumbai or try and tell this story in Hindi. And suddenly it became that, well, who's Rembrandt? Um, there was an assumption, for instance, in the curatorial preface, right? When people entered the, uh, at, the, at the entrance to the show, um, posing a provocative question, what was happening in India at the time when the pyramids were being built in Egypt? A perfectly reasonable question for an English speaking person to, to ask. Convert that into, translate that into Hindi and think about the people who are walking into that exhibition. Does that question even make any sense to them? So you turn the question around and you ask them, what was happening in Egypt when the dancing girl was being made in India or Pakistan <laughs> in the Indus Valley civilization? Because that's their hook. The locus standi changes. And when the locus standi for history changes, the narrative changes, language completely changes the narrative. And this posed many problems in the act of translation because there are so many words, there are such rich vocabularies which are entirely lost today. We don't even know, for instance, the public doesn't even know what is the Indian word for Sasanian. And everyone was transliterating it into Devanagari script as Sasanian or Sasanian, quite forgetting that the word Sasanian comes out of the word Shahin Shahi. So much more easy to understand. Um, Achaemenid, Iran, quite forgetting about the fact that the word Hakamanish is a much more commonly understood word. Um, and so it became with ancient names for geography, for terms of history, because one had to look at the history of India's terms of engagement with the rest of the world and try and see what words and vocabularies existed for places in China or places in Iran and the rest of the world in Indian language texts. And so the mere act of curating was not merely an act of selecting objects, but it meant actually going into lexicography. And that level of research is not what institutions had necessarily bargained for or allowed for the time to be able to do that kind of research. And so it was a, a definite challenge to make the, make the exhibition relevant to those people whose art was being showcased right at the entrance of that exhibition. So it couldn't remain tokenistic by simply including those works for somebody else's perusal, but it had to be relevant in the language for the very people whose art was being exhibited. Um, I think curatorial narratives, therefore, when we start talking about decolonization, we need to start thinking about it much more sensitively than we normally do, because it comes with all these responsibilities as well that are concomitant with a narrative of decolonization, which the institution, the big history museum institution is going to have to take on board as it deals with the vocabularies for decolonization, as it presents those histories in the languages of the people who were colonized.
Can we move to the next slide, please? So um, at one stage in the exhibition towards the end, I had the wonderful providence and uh, luck to be able to stage a display between Amrita Shergill's painting called Two Girls with a Yoruba carving of the Nigerian Queen Victoria. Um, the silhouette of Queen Victoria, like I said, providentially mirrored the silhouette, which has been an inexplicable silhouette in the two girls painting at its very corner. The head, the, well, the jutting nose and a bit of a breast and round outline that you see in the slide. We staged our conversation around freedom and colonization in this gallery. And this was displayed, these things were displayed together right at the entrance to that gallery. As I've written on my slide, the umbrella term decolonization has come to stand for a wide array of requirements, including shifts in the presentation of knowledge and the ownership of artifacts. Juxtaposing two girls by Amrita Shergill with a wooden statuette of Queen Victoria from Nigeria serve to reflect on how colonization and the subsequent globalization have made narratives of ownership of knowledge, property, and even identity no longer associated with a single territory. Two Girls by Shergill, a pioneering mixed race modernist, deals with the questions of freedom, equality, and identity in a globalized world. As it was painted during the momentous period of the rise of fascism in Europe, and that of nationalism in India. This work has always cast a complex shadow, both literally and figuratively, that is filled here by the African Queen Victoria, carved out of wood. Statues of colonial domination, such as those of Queen Victoria, were emplaced across the world in the countries that came under the British Empire. However, the Nigerian artist here has interpreted her as a Yoruba carving. Testimonies challenge the narratives of history. And with that, the museum has to alter the ways in which history is learned. Chronology, which is the spine of the history museum, has tended to present its narratives with an idea of progress. You know, going from one gallery in, in a history museum to another, you are meant to sort of be ennobled by this history of mankind, that this progress of mankind. Um, this is coupled with a growth of logic and reason. These narratives prioritize organized religion, industrialization, urbanization over pastoralism, homesteads, nomadism. And these latter forms are inconvenient for a progressive West, of course, but they're also inconvenient in India, where the exclusion and invisibilization of done by establishments in the past, as it is even now. So the Indian History Museum does not consider these narratives of pastoralism, homesteads, nomadism, the Atavikas, their histories are not as important as the histories of the settled Brahmanical cultures, for instance, in our own history museums. So if a decolonization requirement is there of Western museums, equally there are requirements of Indian museums that have to be uh, taken on board and brought to bear in such, exhibitory, in such an exhibition space. So not only do these histories go against the grain of the enlightenment, and the society that championed the museum, it also leads to a more fundamental problem of how possibly can the museum showcase those civilizations that don't leave material traces through history. You see, in a contemporary milieu, a curator goes and commissions what they want, but with a history museum curator, I have to work with what evidence I get out of a history museum. I can't go around commissioning new things. So uh, this leads to, to problems because 
Museums house things that have withstood the natural course of the depredations of time, things that mark man's conquest of nature, our mass burials, our garbage, our profligacy. These are all markers also of our achievements, except now it is easier and even necessary to allow objects to be categorized differently. And museums, as we all know, thrive on taxonomies, categories of specimens that we group together, symptomatic of a culture, a defining paradigm each time. You know? So a museum collection of one type of porcelain, a museum collection of one type of uh, headhunter, categories of classical, Renaissance, modern, high and low art, folk and popular art, have been destabilized by researches that have shown that, but this and that, and that cannot be dismissed any longer. So now we are in an age where no canon remains watertight as narratives that show that many others went alongside that canon too. Sharing a common roof in a museum lies such disparate objects that researchers and curators will have to work so much harder to build those narrative arcs that can allow them to coexist in the same space. This is a curatorial challenge that we truly face if we really want to confront the decolonizing narrative and a more ethically responsible narrative. Because as I was saying, what traces epitomize one civilization can be very different in nature and can reveal very different priorities to something else that is sharing that space from some other music, from some other culture. So confronted with this right at the outset of how we are going to deal with a universal museum coming into a space like India, when I drafted my concept note right at the beginning for the show, um, can you show me the next slide, please? I, I wrote and I can read out um, what I said at that time, that at the very outset, it must be understood that the intellectual basis for exhibitions on globalization or worlding art, or thinking about art from the perspective of a universal museum, and indeed, even the larger enterprise of thinking about the discipline of history from a post-Enlightenment and a post-Hegelian perspective, does not find easy acceptance or application in non-Western cultures. So this exhibition needs to state, in simple terms, how it is choosing to define the term history and the term world art. We must recall that the mere act of historical and chronological comparison may itself be perceived as a Western or a Hegelian way of approaching a subject. This is an approach which must be adopted with caveats. Different parts of the world view the very concept and idea of history and historical time differently. India has famously used ways to bring back memory and cyclical time in innovative ways, even as India has progressed through linear time. Such an appreciation would have to undergird any exhibition that seeks to imagine, examine India and the world through history. Next slide, please. All words, you might think, all big words lined up together how is it actually going to turn into curatorial practice? Well, this wasn't actually understood. My, what I was trying to highlight right at the outset was not practically understood by all the teams involved till we actually started doing it. And then it began to sink home that it's not working as easily. And the methods to make it work had to then be adopted. And one of the ways in which that I found that we could negotiate that and make it work was to have a display in each gallery that disturbed the narrative of that gallery, that questioned the very premise of that gallery. So we went through a gallery and we entered the great urban cultures of the earliest uh, river valley civilizations of India the ground plan of the city of Mohenjo-daro on one side and the river showcase that was designed by Brinda Somaya and Andani Sampath on the other side, leading to a trompe l'oeil um, background of the, of the water reservoir of Dholavira in Gujarat right at the back. Um, when the audience turned around, next slide, um, they would be 
moving into a display from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa into a display of the earliest uh, a colonnade that would take them into the period of empire. But just before they entered that, at this curve of the river that you see here, was an entire display that questioned urbanization and the great first city's narrative. Similarly, when we entered the other galleries, we, we questioned the display. Um, we used the display to question the narrative in each gallery. So two galleries later, we entered a gallery which everyone wanted because the public would have wanted a gallery like that, which was called court cultures. It was uh, meant to be about courtly uh, decorativeness, grandeur, uh, jewelry, arms and armor, uh, things that the public would really just expect to see and compare, mostly located in about uh, the 16th century, 16th to 18th century, when you had an opportunity to be able to showcase fine Mughal jade carvings and jewelry and so on, alongside what was being made in Elizabethan England and wherever else in the world. But it was going to be a stultified narrative because along with courtly culture came obviously certain courtly etiquette. And that courtly etiquette comes caught up with all kinds of notions of patriarchy, for instance. How could one not talk about that today? So could you show the next slide, please? Um, what we did was that we juxtaposed two objects, both from royal contexts, to reflect on how patriarchal stereotypes were reinforced through the art of the times. The very masculine ceremonial shield of Maharana Sangram Singh of Udaipur was contrasted with a Ming scroll, which showed idealized portrayal of women in Chinese courtly life tending to and contained within their walled gardens, playing musical instruments, dancing, writing, having their portraits made, playing games, all activities thought to be befitting of women. Sangram Singh's shield, which was shown next to it, can you show the next slide? Um, was executed in beautiful neem kalam in gold, shades of gold. Um, and you might be able to see it in a bit of the detail on the left-hand side. Sangram Singh is shown leaving his palace. Um, he goes through eight different moments in time, all in a day's work, the eight prahar, the eight times of a day, um, as it were. And he rides through the shield, coming back home to his palace. And what does he do? What are his daily activities uh, as compared to the Ming scroll where the Chinese act ladies' activities were shown? Well, he first goes to a temple, salutes the god, then he jumps into uh, a pond, picks up a bathing beauty, has his way with her, then he goes into uh, a forest, he shoots some tigers, he then moves and he does some archery practice, etc., etc. Lots of sort of notions of machismo that he would be interest, uh, invested in. And at the end of the day, he comes back home to his palace where all, all his queens have all lined up with their uh, ceremonial platters and lamps in their hands to welcome him back home as their lord. And so you have these sort of differing notions of stereotypes that are being established because both these objects were not just objects made for a court. They were gifts, they were copied they were emulated by those aspiring to the status of that court. Um, let's um, um, we'll keep that slide there for a moment. I, I think um, what we were trying to do was move beyond the requirement to promote harmony in a globalized world there was a propaganda machinery that required us to see that we are all the same, humans all have similar concerns and expressions. A universal museum is meant to foster harmony and allow the world's public to be able to say, oh, we, our culture, your culture, similarities, we're all the same people. Um, and yet at the same time, we have to be able to see that that is a teleology. Audiences thus had to be presented with a demanding or at least a disturbing display instead of counterpoints to the narrative of every gallery within each gallery. And 
we even went as far as having a final gallery to the exhibition that questioned the premise of the whole exhibition, showcasing how we are different and how that difference should be respected and thus lived with, became a more real way for the future when multiple perspectives will each demand space. So I've been trying to show some of these differences and issues and narratives that had to be there as a kind of a tacit subtext that had to run through the galleries. So there was a teleological narrative and then there was the but this and that that had to go alongside. <clears throat> um, um, can we um, move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, so returning to the whole question of decolonization. Uh, as a curator from India, I was often asked that, oh, this is an exhibition that is in collaboration. It's a big ticket exhibition. So there was lots of publicity. Here. And the press was asking standard questions, quite expectable questions that all of you as curators would be familiar with. You know, this is an exhibition where the British Museum is lending objects to India. So will you be getting, getting the great treasures of India back from the British Museum was the standard question that I would be asked in uh, press interviews. And one had to explain that no, it wasn't. And for these reasons, but there was equally a compelling argument on their part to say, well, why not? And if you pressed with that argument, um, you could perhaps say that, well, there was no good reason in a globalized world to not bring objects from India. But then I would turn the question around and ask them, well, what is it from the British Museum that you would really like to see back in India? And the obvious question, the answer would be, oh, well, the beautiful Amravati statues. Shouldn't they be repatriated? And this was coming up so many times that I used this particular object in the exhibition to try and highlight the issue that there are already many objects which are as beautiful as Amaravati, as important, which are lying in utter disrepair and neglect across sites in India. And this particular object was, load, was laden with so many metaphors and so many different narratives that it spoke to this issue of decolonization and repatriation quite directly. The frieze was in smithereens, and it was restored first by the Department of Archaeology in, Telang in Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh, and then subsequently by Telangana State, and then finally made ready for the exhibition by the conservators of the CSMBS Museum itself. So it took three efforts and serious efforts at uh, conservation to make it exhibition worthy. It comes from a site called Fanigiri, which has only recently been excavated in Telangana, a site which is as important as any of the great Amaravati Nagarjuna Konda style pieces of the second to third centuries AD. It tells a very poignant story, that of the young Prince Siddharth before he became the Buddha, who in order to embark on his narrative, on his, on his journey to become uh, the Buddha, on his quest for enlightenment, had to take the first bold step of forsaking his material wealth and possessions. And he did that in the central portion of this frieze where he threw away his kingly turban. The turban is of course the crown and the crown when he tossed it away, never landed back on earth, but just rose up and up and up and kept on rising until it reached the Trayatrimsha or 33rd heaven, Kushita. And in that heaven, uh, the gods gathered the turban and celebrated it. And if you look at the detail in the middle of the slide, you'll see that the entire top of the pillar of the sculpture is sculpted like a turban. Now, a turban is a person's crown. In every investiture ceremony, um, a turban is wound around somebody's head. And every self-respecting turban, especially that of a prince, will have a jewel in the crown. The jewel space in Siddharth's crown 
is very peculiar. In the central medallion, you have five people who are lifting up a tray on their heads. And in the middle of the tray, there is a little turban. So we have a turban inside a turban. But the turban in the middle of the tray, or the turban in the, ju in the jewel space, is the sacrificed turban, not his actual turban, as it were, which is the subject of the sculpture. Sacrifice then becomes the real jewel in the crown, the one who can give away his claim to material inheritance. Rather a sharp story to be able to tell in a narrative requirement in a time when we are talking about repatriation and decolonization, um, to be able to talk about this story about give up your material inheritance. But at the same time, we were making a parallel claim, which was not to give up, which was even though we are giving up material inheritance, we're not giving up the right to a sharing of knowledge. And that sharing of knowledge has to happen in the languages and has to have equality in the way in which that knowledge is shaped, not just disseminated. So what constitutes that knowledge? has to be an equitable space, not the, the, the responsibility for the ownership of the artifact alone. That was not a compromised space. That was not a negotiated argument. So we said that, all right, possession of the material wealth is one thing, but what about the narratives that are going to come out of this exhibition? What happens then? What happens to the public awareness that comes out of it, the books that will come out of it, the videos, the podcasts? the many ways in which that we are disseminating the issues that we are talking about here at this curator's hub. Now this brought up another very interesting question for our times. Anyone who has access to the technology or medium of being able to put out a narrative can make a claim to be heard. However, as we've seen over the past decade, the trend is to drown out the, their voices by those who own the technology or the medium to put out that narrative. The effect of a dominant discourse can be hegemonic, it can be fascist, it can be seemingly very convincing. And yet with persistent regularity, there is the ever present voice of those who dared to think of narratives that mattered to them personally and were shared, they are being followed and subscribed to by a number that is significant enough to constantly challenge that dominant narrative of the institution. So to survive the demands of this requirement for staying relevant, you will have to have institutions, the narrators, they rely on the curators, even when the narration is of a position that is contrary to the establishment, even when the establishment has to pay to have narratives that are critical of that establishment, as long as the basis of the narrative is located in research and serves the demand of a demonstrably appreciable audience. So what lives on through museums then are a variety of narratives, not just objects. The written or the audiovisual communication intersperses the collection of objects like a binding glue. We curators perform our role like uh, like Kintsugi, you know, the beautiful gold that sticks together the bits of broken pots. Lending objects that relevance as well as vice versa, where the objects intersperse a historical narrative. I think in the future, museums will have to contend with the rising potential of these fragments of oral testimonies and texts and the silences as well between those fragments. How will they be preserved? How will they be showcased? Will ethics guard their protection of these narratives? Or will they be blocked because of the rights of ownership over the publishing or the disseminating or that transporting medium? Will histories and voices continue to remain suppressed? And then we need to wrap up. Sure. A perspective of thinking about the museum and its narratives through the more ethical discipline of social design provides us a methodological frame for approaching communication and media studies and a way to think about the language and images that have metaphors to transport or engage the public today. So we use objects in these multiple ways to be able to have 
multiple strands of narratives to be able to deal with the variety of visitors that come into these big public institutions. Can we move to three slides down or two slides down, I think. Next, next, this is the same slide, same object. Next, please, yeah. Finally, yeah, there. The narrative of the last gallery, as I said, which was called Time Unbound, questioned the entire notion of the linear presentation of history, which undergirded the whole exhibition. Difference and a disturbance of the neatly packaged history of the world. A shift in focus in India did not just come about only because of globalization and different nationalities coming to the museum, but for many other reasons too. As I was saying, sexuality, language, social status, or these days because of planetary precarity, um, all made a way in which we were thinking about the narrative, or at least I was trying to think about the narrative. So we ended the, the exhibition rather prophetically in a gallery called Time Unbound, where the last thing that we showed in the exhibition was this bibliomancy card, uh, a tarot card made in um, uh, the Pahari area. And it shows the demon or the, the eclipse, the, the, it shows Rahu, uh, one of the nodes of the moon, which in Indian astrology is supposed to cause eclipses. And it can cause, cause a solar eclipse as well as a lunar eclipse. Rahu swallows up the sun and the moon. Well, if he swallowed up the sun and the moon, there can be no measure of time. And if there is no measure of time, there is a time of chaos. And so we ended the exhibition with this tarot card as our prediction for what is going to ensue. Little knowing, well, it was going to be that, it was going to be that, <laughs> that accurate. Um, I hope I've been trying to sort of bring out some of the kind of, some of the issues and speak to some of the issues that the Curators Hub has been uh, trying to raise by showing the difficulties and how we bring such narratives to bear in historically positioning these narratives through not through commissioning works of art, especially to be able to talk about these issues, but to be able to bring relevance to historical artifacts through the narrative arcs that we give them. I hope also that I've been trying, I've been trying to show how difficult it is to be able to do this through national institutions and how we continue with our dual function as curators, both as curare of custodianship, as well as our job as builders of narratives. That I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Naman. Um, please also post your questions to us and we'll take them on. Um, have to start on a note of urgency in terms of also as we discuss, knowing how rampantly there is a rewriting erasure and Hindutva resurrection of mythologies, legends, sacred and archeological sites being re-termed, renegotiated, occupied in different ways. How would you introduce not only this exhibition but also your pedagogic readings uh, to a bigger audience um, and also kind of beyond the urban intelligentsia? How would one do that? Um, uh, well, I think we tried to do that through multiple ways. I try and think the exhibition through in, at least in Hindi, um, before I um, uh, do it. It's a disciplinary requirement. Um, so every last label and um, explaining it to myself and to multiple audiences. I talk through the exhibition several times. I read the exhibition book um, to myself in multiple languages because certain things that are written in one language assume that you're catering to a particular audience. And the minute you change the register of the language itself, it becomes you become aware of the fact that it sounds so silly and some things just don't need to be said. And you fall, you, you, it's about what checks and balances you have about uh, self-ethnologizing, um, because self-ethnologizing is something that we're all culpable of. And how do we prevent that? Um, we can orientalize ourselves, you know, in the way that we we unwittingly and um, 
And so one has to have certain cautions in place to be able to do that. Um, the rest are all sort of the other platitudinous things to say, tend not to dumb down, um, to be able to make it relevant um, by thinking across, across linguistic barriers or age barriers. Um, so thinking of an entire narrative for the exhibition, as we just heard from the last speaker about from a children's perspective um, or from an elderly perspective or um, in India, one has to think in terms of very plural constituencies because there are different. So when you're looking at the exhibition as a Muslim, as a Muslim woman, as a Muslim woman from Kerala, as a Muslim woman from Kashmir, you know, what do you, how do you think about it? How do you think about the entire exhibition if you're coming to it from a Dalit experience or if you're coming to it from a Brahmanical experience or if you're coming from an urban bourgeois? I mean, you do have to think about the entire exhibition through multiple audiences perspectives. My other question kind of comes to you also just again from thinking about the way you teach about, you know, really taking us to objects and collections which are in a lot of smaller museums, what might be provincial museums, you know, you, you've, you have done that research in villages and towns across India um, to places that people don't even know that there are extremely important collections there and you have been able to document a lot of that work and I'm just trying to think you know the fact that such an exhibition would take place in Bombay I mean that's obviously the first step but also trying to think broader in terms of what happens to those kind of isolated objects in smaller museums and how can we also move into those spaces to have debates, have conversations, you know, really have an exchange in, in a way that this kind of monolithic relationship between say British Museum and National Museum, you know, which even is sort of just manifesting now in terms of these kind of exhibitions that have a critical perspective rather than a nationalistic one. It can't change, the, the balance can't change until we really invest in the capacity building of the regional museums. Um, the regional museums do not have the exhibition spaces or conservation requirements that insurance agencies will allow uh, the great works to be shown at. But that doesn't mean that we can't start a, pro a project of sharing with, from the regional museums and creating exhibition circuits within India at least. Uh, let's not, we, we don't have to limit ourselves by thinking only about bringing objects from world museums to India. Um, we can be fostering and developing a curatorial circuit and sharing of great works from the reserve collections of tiny museums all over the country. Um, uh, sadly, inadequate measures have been put in place to be able to do that. Um, even the conservation requirements of small towns are just not being met and much needs to be done. Um, to be able to bring attention to these, to these curators and to these institutions. I'm also interested in the, um, the ACE and France cities risks and unusual connections that are fostered by early cosmopolitanism, because there is also a very smooth apolitical version of early globalization that can be told. Um, which keeps certain power balances intact, in right? Yeah. Well, at, at the same time, when we go into Gandhara or you see um, a Ganesha made in Indonesia, you know, there's so many other examples. Um, wondering how, you know, you can use India and the world to mobilize those historical connections that are actually troubling uh, because that's where there is a lot of potential. Well, I'm glad you see that. Um, the point is that how do we get audiences to see that? How do we get audiences to make a demand to be told those inequitous histories? Um, our requirement to be able to read those inequitous histories and provide the research for those is hard enough. Um, it's, it's not easy um, because there has been so much silencing in history. So we do have to read texts which can uh, reveal that kind of history and then try and uh, look at the 
art historical record and the archaeological record and see that does it on the whole mirror what we have inflected through that inequity or that difference or that disparaging attitude or whatever it is that we're looking at in the text. Now, I mean, I, I think there are some examples where that could be done. Uh, so there was a wonderful example of being able to show Roman coins uh, of the Emperor Nero, which are found in large quantities in India, even though he is persona non grata in the Roman Empire. Um, so how is it that they that, that bullion landed up in India? Uh, there are questions to be uh, posed about the discovery of, okay, what was the apparatus that took Hinduism to Southeast Asia? Um, how did it spread? What was the nature of that? Was there a certain uh, uh, canonization of Indian scripture and religion and methods of being, and was it a controlling colonizing force or was it actually a participatory force within uh, Southeast Asia? These are questions to be asked. And I think we can pose the questions alongside the objects that we display. We can use the object as a, as a springboard to start a conversation about certain things. I don't know if the object can always answer those questions, but I do think that the, on, the, 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 the narrative that comes out the responsibility of positioning and writing up that label text is as important as the uh, formal study of actually juxtaposing two objects because uh, the narrative actually is the artistic and creative expression of the historian or the curator that is going alongside the, the, the display. And that's why I brought up this entire thing as to who's going to protect that creative output and that labor that narrative research, who's going to copyright that? Where, where does it go? Because it's not in the, it, it's, it's ephemeral. So there are these questions to be asked. And I think as a curator's hub, I mean, this is a disciplinary, a work requirement that all of us as curators need to be thinking about. Um. There is a question from Sujay, and I didn't quite catch which juxtaposition he meant to ask about. So I'm wondering if he wants to ask the question himself via audio. We can unmute Sujay. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's it's primarily looking through the slides, like the first slide you showed, where there is the discobulus statue with the Hanuman, and I I couldn't make out the one in the background. Is that a Kartikeya? No, it's I, Okay, and I was just thinking that the way you place them, as I'm looking through the slides, it always seemed like it really played into the hands of the center and the mi margin kind of a logic in the way they are looking at it. Though you talked about uh, it's uh, it talked about how it is centering around and things. So I was just thinking that how did the audience looked at it? How did the audience rate them in in juxtaposition to these narratives? Did you got any feedback or how was yes, I, I was the way I'm looking at it? Yeah, there are two questions that have come up. I can read a question by Rohit Whirl as well. That you know, that there was almost no violence in the exhibit, and he, which he's very rightly said. And I think these are both very pertinent questions. That um, my desires as a curator, how much was I able to actually make them manifest overtly in the exhibition, and to what extent were these narratives that I'm talking about tacit? Um, and I think the levels at which these, these things operated, um, are, you're very right in asking me this question. I think um, these, both these questions. I think there were um, issues that I could, um, I, I think there were issues that I could actually talk about in the exhibition catalog. Then there was a second narrative that I could talk about in the exhibition text labels. Then there was a third set of narratives that I could come out with in blogs and writings that came up subsequently in the talks that I was giving during the exhibition and through the exhibition at forums, both in India and abroad to call attention to various issues. 
Um, these were being delivered to different constituencies uh, of publics uh, across the spectrum. And then there were the narratives that began to unfold in the press. And I didn't include certain slides, but that is a very important level of the discourse that takes place on an exhibition. Because what happens is that we must think of exhibitions as processes, as not something that is static that happens at the first day of its inauguration, which is often the mistake that is made in many countries in the world and no, particularly here in India, where all lights are on the inaugural night, quite forgetting that the exhibition has a life of the entire duration. And the kind of um, um, things that the media was talking about two months into the show was very different from the kind of storylines that were coming out on the opening night. Because in the run up to the show, it was all about the propagandist bonhomie of, you know, peace in the world, lovely world, aren't we all common history of humanity, the shared history and so on. But I think by the time we were reaching the second month of the show, the, the newspapers were carrying a very different set of narratives. This question about decolonization, for instance, had started coming up even in the Mumbai Mirror. Um, there were uh, big stories about it, full page sort of flashy stories about, uh, about that. And um, in Bombay itself. So I know that the, the Marathi press carried narr narratives and stories in Bombay, which were questioning these kinds of issues, using the ob object juxtapositions to be able to show um, these kinds of issues of patriarchy, of violence that was there in the world, not just in the last gallery, but even in the gallery on court culture, um, the, the, it was there, or how, what is the role of um, state and religion? A very thorny subject. Can you imagine the Maharashtra press having to talk about, um, the Marathi press talking about state and religion? Um, and we had used the gallery of the Gupta coins in the fifth century to talk about how there was a time of great empires, which were all founded in a religious ideology. Um, and what is the nature of the sponsorship of state and religion and how that's very different from what had happened in previous centuries? What was the nature of the shift in civilization that led to that? So I think there were all these narratives. I mean, we've had limited amount of time, but they, they, the public discourse then began to pick and we laid ourselves open to that public discourse, you see? It wasn't accidental that these kinds of stories were all coming out. These, these were um, new ways and other ways that were very much in mind at the time of the creation of the show, but they were released in, in stages at, in, with time lags. So we had repeat visitors to the show as well. Naman, there's two more questions if I could if I could go on to those. Okay. And then we are going to have time for this informal discussion where we will stop broadcasting and those who wish to stay on can have a, a bigger conversation, which will not be so moderated, I promise. Um, so the last two questions are um, by Rohit Goel, who, who builds on the question about globalization. Um, was there an asynchronous I just promise. answered that. Okay. I saw his question. Uh, that's what you answered. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. I beat you to it. Yeah. Okay. So the, then the last one, right? Yeah. What's uh, that? How can oral history contribute, which you also sort of did talk about to an extent, but if you want to say more about oral history and contributing to with by Chaiti now, a decanonizing temperament which is a good way to put it. How far the narrative or narratives of it is placed in formal research and development and ideating an exhibition that display objects, that displays objects from the past. You know, the publishers aren't willing to take it on. It's still not happening. The, we're trying, we create the opportunity for this. And yet something, there is a hurdle. There is still a very major hurdle. I, I don't think the discourse is out there. The conversation, these conversations are not in the media. Uh, 
adequate. They are not shaping public opinion in that way. Art history is not being used for, these pur for this purpose. Uh, political re rhetoric and discourse is there, but art history is not being used to these ends adequately. And it can, and it must. Okay. On that note, I'm going to officially thank you. Thank and you. we're going to then have this moment of um, discussion together. So please do stay on. Um, in, in closing, I, I want to just note how, you know, we've moved from Luli Ashragi's presentation that was deeply personal, but still speaking to what it means to build a collective response to global indigenous curating, what that means working within educational setups, working across medium and small scale arts organizations, but then also thinking in larger constellations of Biennale making such as Nirin in the Sydney Biennale is really an excellent example of what it means uh, for indigenous practices to be foregrounded and be the ground upon which a uh, contemporary art biennale can take place, can debate the conditions of production and of collaboration. We also had um, Reem Fada who has moved in her own um, career from a certain kind of collection-based practice, research practice into now shaping the cultural foundation in the UAE and who was also generous in a reflexive um, response to her own position within that institutional be, uh, building structure as a Palestinian curator, uh, thinking again about what it means to break these hierarchies of contemporary art, applied arts, and the kind of artist pedagogies that inspired uh, pan-Arab modernism and what that means perhaps also moving from West Asia to South Asia what we can learn and do in terms of not only retrospective ex retrospectives as exhibition models, but also perhaps again, thinking about how these informal histories of modernism can speak beyond um, the institutional structure as well. And then finally, uh, coming to Naman's presentation, I think we've also just had this discussion. So there's a lot that we can hopefully build on from Naman's propositions as well. And with it, really thinking about the way that our tools as contemporary practitioners can also build into the question of ancient history, antiquity, where there's a lot of contestation, rightly so, but how can that then be mobilized into a sort of general foundational kind of conditions for museum viewing, for moving out of the capital into other forms of hopefully more dispersed conversations. And that's just a hope perhaps how we can all kind of also take that up. And I think definitely firstly, also for us to learn um, the plural histories of these objects is what is essential. If we ourselves are not informed enough, then we are also succumbing to this rampant rewriting and erasure that is taking place under the current regime. So there's a lot of self-education involved in knowing um, the more ruptured, more dispersed civilizational histories that India has, has experienced. I now have my cat on the table who has jumped on. It's definitely a sign that we can make this informal. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we can put cameras on for those who wish to, and we will continue formally tomorrow. Thank you. Okay.